It started as a joke. Then, of course, there's the shark, said Tina. She waited, gauging the reaction of the tourist in the seat next to her. Shark? the tourist said. Not outright dismissal, then. Tina felt her throat relax, felt the lubricant of story slick her tongue and teeth, and then she was speaking. The Doe and Water Shark! Haven't you heard of it? It was quite famous in the sixties and seventies, although it's not been seen recently, which is good. Why? Is it dangerous? Still disbelief in the tourist's voice though his eyes had turned limpid, like pools of still water waiting for the thrown rocks, waiting for the ripples. No, well, not really. There was a child who vanished. She could have been kidnapped, but it was quiet the day she disappeared, and no one saw anything funny. She could have drowned, but it's a lake, and bodies float after a bit, don't they? People said the shark got her. "'Sharks can't live in fresh water!' exclaimed the tourist suddenly, anger spiking his voice and tensing the flab of his jowly face. "'Some can,' said Tina, defensive but not too defensive, just a little hurt creeping into her tone. "'Anyway, the Derwent Water Shark is only a name. It doesn't mean it actually is a shark. It could be a big catfish or a pike or anything.' No one's ever photographed it, or even really seen it clearly. They've just seen a big pale shape moving in the water. The year after the girl vanished, a couple capsized one of the rowing boats when they were out in the middle of the lake. The man drowned, but the woman survived, and she swore that something had hit the boat from underneath and forced them over. Of course, no one believed her. Not really. Not until they found his body. The sun made Derwent Water's surface a rippled sheet of burnished copper. The tourist leaned forward in the bench seat of the launch and dropped his voice, conspiratorial. Tina had a sudden image of him as a great fish, a different sort of Derwent Water shark, wriggling and hooked, being reeled in. Was he eaten? No. Well, they said no. Back then, there weren't half the rules about boats on the water that there are now. So what happened to him, to his face and body, could have been caused by a propeller. If it was going fast, that is. My dad told me that all that summer, people were talking about how few ducks and geese and swans there were on the water, and how pets were going missing, drowning in the lake, or at least going swimming and not coming back. Eventually, some people from the Natural History Museum came up and did some tests, looked around, but they said that nothing was wrong. It was one of them who gave whatever it was the name Doe and Water Shark, actually. He was being interviewed by the local papers and said it as a joke that maybe Doe and Water had its own shark, and the paper used it as a headline, and that was that. Really? Really? Nothing serious has happened since. But every time someone goes missing round here, and they've been seen on or around or in the lake, or if something happens to one of the rowboats, people say it's the shark. Every now and then there's a sighting, and a TV crew comes and does one of those humorous end-of-show segments, but no one ever proves anything. The pier was approaching. Tina had to wrap this up fast. People don't like years like this year, though. Why? Total trust, total belief. Later, maybe, the tourist would question. But not now. Now he was Tina's. Look around, said Tina. There's not many birds. Indeed, it was a blustery day early in the hatching season, and the birds would most likely be in the less populated areas on the islands in the lake centre, still mistrustful of people. But to the tourist, there are no birds because they're being eaten. It means the sharks around. It wasn't that Tina disliked tourists. In fact, she quite enjoyed their company. Living in the Lake District was far from the romantic ideal that people imagined. It was claustrophobic with people and noise and high season, and cold, wet and depressed off-season, 
and Tina hated it. Tina's father had come here as a child and loved it, returning to live with his family when Tina was young. When he talked about Keswick and Lodor and the other surrounding towns and villages, it was with quiet pride in his voice, with awe and love and belonging, and tourists had the same tone in their voice. With their garish clothes and bulging bags and too loud voices, they gave Tina's world colour and shape, stretched its edges to new horizons. If she had been able to articulate it, Tina might have said that she was returning a favour by telling stories, making the tourists' world a little more interesting by giving them a mystery to savour and enjoy. Tina's stories populated her home, a place whose economy was based on transient visitors, low wages and minimal opportunity, with the kind of things she wanted to be there, smothering the mundane reality. So for her, a simple question about the lake, what fish are in there, do you know, was a springboard to a more exciting world. The idiot fish, the derwent water shark, would give the tourist something to ponder, speculate, and would ensure he remembered derwent water for the rest of his holiday, if not the rest of his life. Tina's shift in the bar didn't finish until late, and she was exhausted by the time it was over. The launch didn't run at night, so she took the bus around the lake to her home near Hall's End, its lolling rhythm sending her into a half-sleep. Rattling along the dark roads, her head resting against the dirty pane that revealed the shadowed stone walls and sloped earth of the countryside beyond, Tina let herself drift. The mild susurrus of conversation surrounded her like a delicate massage. As ever, the other passengers were mainly residents of the area returning to their homes after working in Keswick, with a smattering of tourists thrown in. Their conversations reassured Tina, a varying constant of moans about wages and workloads, discussions about the love lives of colleagues, plans for future trips or meals, and ongoing commentaries about how dark it was with no street or house lights, how bright the stars were, and how many of them there were in the sky, about how wonderful it all was. About sharks. Tina's head jerked upright, processing the just-heard conversations until she pinned down the right one. Unobtrusively, she turned towards its source, two women opposite her, both tourists. Carefully, she let her ears join in the talk. And he said there was a shark, something big, in Derwent water. No. Yes, it attacked some people a few years ago, but hasn't been since, so it's likely died or, or maybe found a passage to the sea or to another lake. But if there's been one, it stands to reason that there could be more, doesn't it? The passage to the sea or another lake was new, Tina thought, smiling. Her shark was growing. Tina was busy for several days after that. Her dad needed more help than usual around the house and one of the other bar staff left suddenly. Between the extra shifts and doing more at home, Tina had little time to eat, and certainly none to speak to friends or spin tall tales. Her daily trip across the lake to Keswick on the launch was a time to rest, and she kept herself to herself, so that when she opened the Keswick reminder the following week and saw the headline, Local Fisherman Sees Whopper Get Away, it was the first she'd heard of the story. Reading on, Tina was startled to discover that local man Kerry Armstrong was fishing off Low Brandlehoe when he saw a large grey fish break the water about 60 yards from shore. The article, written in the slightly tongue-in-cheek tone of a reporter who doesn't really believe what he's writing about, went on to say that Armstrong, who lived out at Rothswaite, and who knew Tina by sight, but not to talk to, was definite that the thing in the lake was not a log. It was, he said, something that moved and was bigger than anything he'd seen in Derwent Water before in fifty years of fishing. Tina grinned as she read the article. Armstrong had been drinking, seen a big plank or tree trunk and assumed it was his whopper fish. Tina wondered if the tourist had seen the article and if he had taken it as further proof of the shark's existence. 
Her shark was swimming by itself now. A couple of days after Armstrong's sighting, Tina arrived at work to find her colleagues talking about the thing that had been seen in the lake. Apparently, a full launch of seventy people, on a journey between high and low Brandlehoe, had watched for five minutes as something large had kept place with them, fifty feet or so off the starboard bow. Mostly seen by the wake it made, it broke the surface several times, briefly revealing a grey flank and the impression of fins. The wake made by the thing was large, and most people on the launch were agreed that the thing was metres in length rather than feet. Finally, as the launch came into High Brandlehow, it disappeared with a splash. All of the photographs taken showed little more than swells on the water's surface, or a grainy shape, indistinct under the ripples. Opinion differed as to what the thing was. Kelly, the youngest member of staff, was convinced it was a lake monster because she said seriously, all lakes had monsters, didn't they? And besides, all lakes were linked by subterranean passages. So even if Derwent Water didn't have its own monster, one could have swum in, couldn't it? Ollie, older and wiser and desperate to bed Kelly, agreed, but said it might be a sturgeon, which were huge and were often mistaken for monsters, and said that he'd heard about the subterranean passages as well. Mary dismissed the idea out of hand, saying it was an uprooted tree mowing in the launch's wake, or currents swirling as the boat passed and giving the impression of something alive, and Jenny said it was most likely a collective hallucination. No one mentioned the reminder's article about Armstrong, and Tina didn't raise it. No one mentioned sharks. At the end of her shift, Tina just wanted to be home, but her bus wouldn't arrive for half an hour, so to kill the time she walked down to the lakeside and sat on the dock. The sound of the water lapping at the jetty's pilings and licking its way along the shore was comforting, helping to wash away her tiredness. At this time of night, the sound of the town and its lifeblood tourists was a background hum rather than a primary shout, and the air felt clean and fresh, renewed by the darkness. She liked the way the water lapped against the side of the boats, and it was at times like this, when the world was quiet, that she came closest to understanding her dad's feelings. The landscape itself was a drama that both calmed you and raised you up, redolent with permanence and solidity and strength. It was calm, quiet, gentle, too quiet. There were no bird noises. All the way home, as the bus jolted its way along the country roads, Tina tried to dismiss it as a coincidence. There was nothing in the lake, nothing large, and certainly no sharks. Nothing had eaten the birds or scared them away. They were simply asleep in their roosts or nests. What had started as a story was still a story, and everything else was happenstance. Unrelated things she was looking at wrong. It was nonsense. Nonsense. By the time she made it home, Tina had mostly persuaded herself. And anyway, and anyway, she had to help her father, who hadn't gone to bed but had fallen asleep in the chair. Missing birds or not, life went on, and everything was okay, until the dog got eaten. Actually, there was no evidence that the dog was eaten, but the reminder strongly implied it. It was a story about a local man, Amos Hart, whose dog, poor Nipper, had been swimming in Derwent water when something large and grey had risen up from the water behind him and come down on the unfortunate dog with a large splash. Poor Nipper had let out a yelp that were cut off halfway through and disappeared under the water with the large shape, never to return. Amos Hart was reported to be heartbroken, and although the word shark was not used in the article at all, there was a comment about a large carnivorous fish somehow having been introduced into the lake. Other explanations for the incident were suggested, that Nipper had suffered some sort of fit and made the large splash himself as he cramped and went below the surface, or that he had somehow tangled himself up in submerged plants or branches, 
and that it was this that Hart had seen, as Nipper thrashed and tried to free himself. But neither of these explanations were treated seriously. Hart was said to be devastated by his loss, and called via the reminder's pages for something to be done. What the something was, he did not say. Whatever the reminder said, Tina was sure that no one would give the story, or at least the explanation offered for it, credence. But she had forgotten how much people liked her tall tales, how much they apparently wanted to believe. Both her colleagues and the customers at the bar were full of the story, and every one of them seemed to have some additional detail not reported in the paper. There was the fisherman, who had had his pole yanked from his hand, and seen the wake of something large swimming away with the pole trailing in the water behind it, and the other dog that now refused to go in the water despite previously swimming regularly, and the hotel manager on his way to work early one morning, who had seen something pale mowing through the water about twenty feet from the shore, something that moved fast before disappearing with a flick of something that looked disturbingly like a triangular fin. Tina had the uncomfortable sensation that the world was tilting and yawing around her as she listened to these anecdotes. Everyone had something to add, some extra little detail that made the thing in the lake more real, stories of sightings and near misses and things a friend had definitely seen, and all around Tina the shark swam, and she could only watch in belly-clenched wonder. It was Maggie who said the most disturbing thing, though. Sensible, humorless Maggie, who co-owned the bar and treated life as though it were a set of entries in a register, rather than a thing to be lived and enjoyed. Of course it's happened before, back when I was a girl, she stated one day. They did investigations. Tina thought she'd misheard. In the week following Nipper's suspected demise, although his corpse had not been recovered yet, the story had circled and swooped around the district, and every version Tina heard was different, larger or broader or deeper than the previous ones. But this... Cautiously, not wanting the answer, she asked, What investigations? Back in the sixties or seventies. I don't remember exactly. No, wait, it must have been the late sixties as I hadn't started school, and I began that particular joy in seventy-one. There were some sightings of the shark then, and someone died, so some scientists came from London to investigate. Of course they didn't find anything, but they never do, do they? I mean, the death was probably an accident, but still, you don't know, do you? Are you sure? Yes, of course I am, snapped Maggie, suddenly back into the now from her memories of then. Work, Tina, not gossip, that's what I pay you for. That night... Tina's dad was asleep in the chair again when Tina got in from her shift. But instead of hurrying him up to bed, Tina woke him up and started to talk to him. Tina's dad, who seemed to have collapsed in on himself since the death of his wife three years earlier, listened with roomy-eyed concentration. Dad, did you ever tell me about something in the lake? Something big? Or about people coming from London to investigate it? It was the only solution, as far as Tina could see, that the Derwentwater shark was real, something that Tina had heard from her dad, who loved to tell Tina about the history and myths of the place they had moved to. And then Tina had all but forgotten it, only for it to spout forth as a story on that stupid day weeks ago. Something in the lake? You mean like a fish or the Loch Ness Monster? Dad was smiling. Tina didn't smile back. Yes, no, I don't know, just something in the lake, something that bothered people, bothered them enough to call people in to investigate, I mean. Tina's dad thought for a while and then said, No, there was never anything like that. Derwent Water's a fairly dull lake for monsters, I'm afraid. The next day, during her lunch break, Tina went to the library and asked to see the old issues of the Keswick Reminder. She flicked through the huge bound collections, not bothering to read the articles, just the headlines. In a town where little ever happened, the arrival of investigators looking for a creature in the lake would have been headline news, but it did not appear at any point in the issues from the 60s or 70s. 
It hadn't happened. And yet everyone was saying it had. Her shark, it seemed, was gaining weight. In the first film, the man is smiling. He sits in the back of one of the rowing boats that tourists hire by the hour, and the sunlight glints across the lenses of his spectacles as he laughs at whoever is filming. Over his shoulder, the flat expanse of Derwent water sparkles in the early summer light. The man has his arms crossed over his knees, and the oars pulled into the boat are lying loosely by his ankles. So, Tamsin, asks the man, how are you enjoying being rowed around the lake? The unseen camera operator replies, her voice thick with laughter. It's very pleasant, thank you, Steve. But, but don't stop yet. We appear to have stopped in the middle. Onwards, lazy husband. The man, Steve, grins even more widely and goes to pick up the oars. As he bends forward, however, the boat jerks violently, jolting up. For a brief moment the picture shakes wildly, showing first sky and then grey water. Someone screams, although whether male or female it is impossible to tell. There is the sound of splashing water and then Tamsin lets the camera go. In the brief, spiralling view the water can be seen, and in it the impression of someone thrashing and alongside them a large moving shape. There is another scream as the camera finishes its fall into the bottom of the boat, ending up staring blindly into the sky as the scream cuts off sharply. The clip ends with a moment of stillness, before Tamsin's voice sounds, crying, Steve! in an endless, despairing wail. The clip, taken on Tamsin's mobile phone, was the headline item on the main news shows. It rolled on constant repetition on the news channels, with banner headlines scrolling across the bottom of the screen. Man disappears in Derwent water, and Barrister Steve Marsh, 37, feared drowned. It was the most shown piece of film for perhaps eight hours, until the second clip was released. This one is taken from one of the search boats. It started as a mass of black and white, blurred flashes, resolving as the focus tightens into the surface of the water at night. The tips of the agitated waves catch light from somewhere, but lose it in the heavy troughs and eddies. People are shouting, hoarse voices, although the only word that escapes the melee is Jesus. Whoever is holding the camera or phone is shaking and moving, running alongside the side of a boat which, it becomes clear, is moving. Their left hand comes into view for a brief moment, reaching forward to grasp the rail and stop them stumbling. Finally, they come to a standstill and train the camera at the water again. At first, there is nothing except reflections and glittering, broken light, and then something pale comes into view. Initially, it stays several feet below the surface, a large, grey, torpedo-shaped thing keeping pace with the moving boat, but without detail because of the intervening water and darkness. There are more shouts and, at one point, the camera swings about to show people in uniforms lined along the boat's rail. One of them gestures furiously down at the water and the camera swings back to the lake. The thing has risen and is now just below the surface. It is a shark. Its breed is hard to determine and later people will argue about morphology and genus. But it is clearly a shark. Pale and long, its fins scythe out from its flanks and back, its tail flicks lazily, and the black slashes of its gill slits are clear behind the bullet head. The camera wobbles again, and then a light appears, a circle of bright and constant illumination that plays across the surface of the water. It darts back and forth, and someone's voice can clearly be heard shouting, Keep it fucking still! And then the light takes hold of the shark and grips tight. Whoever is holding the torch or spotlight dances the light up the great undulating body until it finds the head, and for perhaps three or four seconds the creature is in sharp focus. It turns as it swims, tilting over slightly as though attempting to get a better look at the boat and the people on it. Its black, depthless eye stares at the camera 
and its mouth opens, a dark triangle against the pale grey of its head. There is a flash of teeth, vast and numberless, and then the fish wheels away from the boat and dives, dropping out of view as the gloomy water swallows it. In the days following the two clips being made public, things moved very quickly. Tina watched as, around her, Keswick and the surrounding towns changed. Police prevented anyone except officials from going out onto the water, and suddenly there were lots of official men and women with badges and cameras in the streets and on the television. The atmosphere changed as well. New tourists arrived and brought with them a sense of expectancy and danger. Most crowded along the shores of Derwent Water and stared out across it, filming every ripple and splash and shouting with exaggerated whoops and cries when they believed they saw something. Tina, working double shifts at the suddenly busy bar, heard the kind of conversations she had only dreamed about. Clustered around the tables, the officials talked increasingly desperately about water vectors and relative temperatures and food chain imbalances and once primary predator intrusion. But what no one did was explain how the shark had got into Derwent water, or how it was surviving. On the third day, just as the film of the shark was being shown less, replaced by the latest terrorist atrocities abroad, the shark was seen again. This time it was caught as a sonar trace, crossing through the water at the north end of the lake. Printouts of the sonar appeared on the news, along with interviews with the machine's operator talking in breathless excitement how he had tracked the thing for minutes before he lost it. Tina watched in disbelief. How had this happened, she thought, not for the first time. She had made the damn thing up. It wasn't real. It was a story she had invented for a gullible tourist, and yet, all about her, evidence of its existence was growing. There was more film taken from the shore, showing a triangular fin slicing through the water forty yards offshore, jumbled eyewitness reports from observers on the boats, three still photographs taken with an underwater camera, showing a mouth like a gasp turned upside down and heavy with jutting teeth. Tina watched as the shark gained in solidarity until even she could not deny its existence. However it had happened, the Derwent Water Shark, and heaven help her, they were even using that name in the newspapers now, had become flesh and blood, was prowling the waters of the lake, and she could not help but feel that it was in some way her fault. Tina finally told someone about how she felt the night the boy got eaten. The boy was part of a group of teenagers, the news reports and eyewitnesses said, and they had been drinking all day. At some point in the afternoon, the boys in the group started daring each other to wade out into the water as far as they could, clearly enjoying the shock they were giving the watching tourists. The first of them got to knee depth, several more got to mid-thigh, and one, wading with a lurching, drunken gait, got out to a point where the water lapped at his waist. No one filmed what happened next, which was maybe for the best. The boy, Neil something, Tina never caught his last name, turned to the shore and raised his hands above his head in a victory stance, calling, How's that? He began to dance, jumping clumsily up and down in the water and sending ripples out from him in expanding rings. People on the shore called for him to wade back in, but he ignored them, continuing to dance and shake his fists about. Several of the bystanders called the police, and out on the lake the timbre of the boat engines changed, as they turned and began to head towards the bay in which Neil cavorted. Those watching from the shore saw the distant boats heading for them and began to relax. They thought everything would be okay, they reported later, because the authorities were coming. It was another change in the pitch of the engine tones that was the first sign that something was wrong. Suddenly the boats were powering across the water, and even from a distance those on the shore could hear the urgency in the sound. They heard the shouts from the crews, and then the first of them saw the wake approaching the boy. A vast triangle, it was several hundred yards away from Neil, but arrowing at him at massive speed. The teenager stopped dancing and started to wade in towards his friends as everyone on the shore began to scream and shout, but he never stood a chance. The shark, 
its mouth open, rose up from behind him and bit down, its mouth crunching onto the boy's torso, with a sound like the breaking of thick twigs, before it disappeared in a red, wet thrashing. Neil didn't get as far as opening his mouth to scream. The shark twisted, its great flank rolling out of the water as the watchers on shore screamed, and then it dived, passing beneath the first of the arriving boats and out into the depths of the lake. At first, Tina tried to tell people that the shark wasn't real. She started at work, talking to Mary and Jenny, but both of them looked at her as though she was mad, and Jenny said that it was in poor taste to make jokes about the shark, seeing as it had killed two people. When Tina tried to explain, Jenny got annoyed with her and told her she was being horrible, so she stopped. She got the same reaction from everyone else, or at least variations of the same reaction. Her friends thought it was a bad joke, and the one official she told, who was sitting in the bar nursing a pint of locally brewed ale, simply stared at Tina until she backed away, apologising. No one believed her. But it was true. The shark was a joke, a fucking story. And it couldn't be swimming around Derwent water. Couldn't be, but was. Finally, she went back to the library. She would prove that this was nonsense. She took the Keswick reminder collections down from the shelves again, hoping to show someone that there was nothing there. But even as she carried them to the table, one fell open, and a headline, in stark black and white, glared up at her. Keswick Shark. No evidence, say experts. The article was old. It was bound into the collection in the same way as the others were. The pages were yellowing and brittle with age. The printing was the same hazy print of the others. It was real, Tina knew as she read through it. It just hadn't been there the other day when she looked. It was a new article, but old. It was new history. She had no idea what it meant or how it had happened, but it meant the shark was now real, not just in the present, but in the past as well. My shark is eating people, Tina whispered to herself on the bus home later, and very quietly she began to cry. It was Tina's dad who told her what to do in the end. When Tina got back from work, the tears still pressing the backs of her eyes and creating salt streaks across her cheeks and down the back of her throat. Her father said, What's wrong, Tina? Oh, Dad, said Tina, I've done something awful. I made something up and now people think it's real. It is real. It's become real and there's nothing I can do. People are being hurt and it's all my fault. Her dad sat nodding, his eyes sympathetic, and relief ballooned in Tina as he spoke. Her father had become wizened and mostly helpless in recent years, crumbling away and leaning more and more heavily on Tina for help with even the most simple of tasks. But in that moment he was neither old nor helpless. He was just Tina's dad, and Tina could be a child again and need help. It's easy to say things you don't mean, said Tina's dad when Tina had finished, but not to unsay them. Things have a way of escaping from you, don't they? And sometimes, if you can't stop what you've said getting away from you, you have to go to the heart of what you said and face it, stop it that way. It might hurt, but our pride is a small price to pay, I'd say, if it stops others being hurt. Wouldn't you? Yes, said Tina quietly. The water tapped quietly at the side of the boat, chuckling against the wood. The boat pitched and rolled as Tina rowed, keeping her movements slow and careful as she aimed the small craft out into the centre of Derwent water. She had to be quiet, as the curfew imposed after the first confirmed sighting was still in place, and only official boats mostly larger yachts or the launches commandeered for the purpose, were allowed on the water. In the midnight darkness, 
Tina's craft was a small blot of moving shadow against the softly breathing water, or so she hoped, and now that she was away from the dock and the lights from the town, she was almost invisible. What her dad had said wouldn't leave her alone, had been in her belly all day, clumped into a ball like mud gathered round a stone, even though she was not sure her dad had really understood the situation that Tina found herself in. She decided that she liked the idea that her dad had been giving her advice, thinking that Tina had hurt some boy's feelings, or offended one of her friends, rather than about how she might undo a giant shark's reality. It made things manageable, and it made her happy that she had protected her dad from the world beyond their home's walls. Let him stay happy, thought Tina, and not know what I've done. And if Tina couldn't tell people, she could, but they didn't believe her despite her best efforts, then she would have to do something else. The question was, what? It helped that her shift finished late, and that even the tourists were mostly in bed by the time she made it out of the bar. The scientists were also gone from the streets and the lake, and she knew from overheard conversations that they did little at night except guard the lake and maintain the curfew. So far, several people had been arrested for trying to get onto the water with the intention of catching or killing the shark, but they had all tried to do so using big, noticeable boats. Tina's plan was simpler and smaller. She was going to steal a rowboat. The rental agencies had suffered because of the shark, with their rowboats left dry on the shore by the main dock. Although they were chained, it didn't take Tina long to cut through the chain with the bolt cutters she had brought from home. The noise was loud in the night, but not loud enough to attract anyone's attention. No one came and stopped her as she pulled the boat into the water, or used one oar as a punt to push away from the shore and no one stopped her when she reached the middle of the lake and began to throw meat into the water. The meat was from the bar restaurant, another small theft that Tina would have to pay back later. She hated stealing, hated where she had come to, but she could see no other option. She had to face the shark, stare it down and make it unreal again, make it a story and not a thing of flesh and blood. It was almost unreal anyway, she thought, no shark should have been able to survive in the cold, fresh water of Derwent water, and certainly not one as large as this. There wasn't enough food for it for a start, and the water would poison it. Surely, she thought, it wouldn't take much to tip it back from mostly unreal to completely unreal. Just a little pressure, a small push, and it would be gone, back to wherever it came from. She just needed to call it, to see it, and to let it see her and then apply the pressure. The meat was her calling card, and soon the scent of it, rich and dank, filled the air around her and covered her hands as he threw more and more in the water and watched it sink in slow, lazy swirls. It was surprisingly noisy out on the lake. The air in the small boat seemed to vibrate like the skin of a drum, magnifying the sounds around Tina. Water struck against the boat's wooden flanks, Distant birds called, car engines caught and slipped as vehicles made their way around the lake on roads that dipped and rose, their headlights slithering across the surface of the water. A breeze snagged in the trees, whispering around her as she baited the water, and the oars shifted and settled in the rowlocks in metallic counterpoint. Tina could see the lights of Keswick, a razor's slash of pearls along the line of the horizon, that separated the cold stars above from the glitter of the water around her. Tina had almost run out of meat when something bumped against the boat. It wasn't a hard bump, just enough to make the small craft rock slightly, tilting it one way and then back the other, and sending Tina into a wobble that slid her off the seat. She fell into the base of the boat, landing in amongst empty bags that were smeared with blood and stinking of meat. One of the oars shuddered, its voice a quiet shriek in the night, and then Tina was up and peering over at the water as the boat rocked and splashed, and the water licked up and then down its wooden sides. She could see very little, 
the water's surface caught the light and broke it, sending shards of yellow and white this way and that, and hiding the blackness below. Tina tried to remain still so that the boat would stop rocking, but it did not help. A wave shifted, a moving hump of water that set the tiny craft back onto its heels, and then dragged it into the trough it left behind. A bow wave, thought Tina distractedly. And then she was looking further out, trying to see where the wave had originated. There? No, that was just more ripples and fractured light. There? No. There? No. Yes! Jesus, yes! And Tina saw the shark. It was huge, far bigger than the boat, and it was moving slowly just below the surface of the water. She could see its pale flanks and, as it rose up, an emerging fin that created a smaller wave which haunted the larger one. It moved glacially along the side of the boat as Tina watched, its great snout just below the water, fragmented and broken by the dancing lights but still there, still real, its black and hopeless eye glimmering, and its mouth a serrated blackness darker and deeper than the water could ever hope to be. Tina could not move as she watched it, its tail flicking lazily and circling the boat as though sizing it up. Tina had the awful feeling that the thing was staring out past the water and directly at her, challenging her in some way. Perhaps it was growing. It certainly seemed larger than in the film taken from the search boat. Maybe it was her own fear giving it flesh, magnifying it to terrible proportions. How big could it grow? she wondered. How big could it get before its impossibility was too strong to ignore? Thirty feet? Forty? A hundred? No. That was preposterous. This was all preposterous, and Tina had to finish it now. You aren't real, Tina said quietly, gazing into the shark's featureless eye as it continued to move around her. The circles were getting tighter and tighter, Tina realized, the distance between the fish and the boat lessening until finally it bumped against the boat again. You are not real, Tina repeated. The shark continued to bump against the boat, pushing against it with its nose. The boat shook, sending Tina to her hands and knees again, gripping one oar for stability, and feeling the cold lake water as it splashed over the side and sprayed against her. Unsteady in the darkness, she saw that the shark had moved away, was turning and starting towards her. Was turning and starting towards her. It was gaining speed, its tail thrashing the water to white foam behind it, and its mouth stretching wide. This cannot be happening! Tina shrieked to herself, a wordless scream. This is not real, it is not real, it is not real, it is not, 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 not, not. And then the shark was rising up against the side of the boat, and its mouth was crunching down on the wood, and shaking the boat like a terrier with a ragged toy, and Tina was swinging the oar and shouting, You're a story I made up! You're not real! The oar passed through nothing but air. The boat jounced violently as it settled, dropping back to find its own balance, only slowly. The shark had vanished, leaving Tina staring at a patch of black reflecting water. She looked around the boat, staring out over the lake for the telltale V-shaped wake of the fish, or its great pale shape moving under the water, but the patterns of ripples were uniform all around her. Was that it? Had it finally gone? Was this just the lake again? Derwent water, a place Tina now realized she loved as much as her dad did. Had she done it? Tina ran her fingers over the side of the boat, but the wood where the shark had bitten was unmarked. Tina allowed herself a small smile and thought, Perhaps this is what God feels like when he creates and destroys things. And then the boat was rising through the air and tilting, pitching Tina out, and the water was rushing to meet her, and then she was submerged. It was cold, beyond cold, freezing. Tina started to shiver almost instantly, 
and for a terrible moment was so disorientated that she could not work out which way was up or down, where the surface was, which direction to kick for. She saw her bubbles rise, felt how she was floating, and chased them, breaking the surface, gasping. She tore air into her stunned lungs, feeling the bitter water cling and drag at her. She stared about, kicking his legs in an effort to stay afloat, whipping her head around, but seeing nothing besides the waves she herself had made, and beyond them the capsized boat floating, turtle-like, back towards the shore. Thrusting her face into the water, she peered through the gloom, trying to spin and see in all directions at once. There! There! In the distance, something pale moved against the darker curtain of water. The shark was coming. How can it still be here? thought Tina as she watched the shape come slowly towards her. No hurry or urgency in its movement. She could make out its mouth now, opening and closing as it came for her, its teeth stark against the black moor. How can it still be in the lake? I faced it! I won! Lack of breath forced Tina to raise her face from the water, and she saw the lights from the town ahead of her, and suddenly she knew. She might have faced it, asserted the shark's unreality, but they had not. All of those people believing, all terrified maybe, all horrified, but wanting mysteries, wanting to believe in a fish that should not be there, all of them giving it life. Tina screamed as below, a vast, pale shape rose towards her.